Essay four, part two of Unto This Last. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unto This Last Four Essays on the First Principles of Political Economy by John Ruskin. Essay four, Ad Valorum, part two. The quality and kind of labor being given, its value, like that of all other valuable things, is invariable. But the quantity of it, which must be given for other things, is variable, and in estimating this variation, the price of other things must always be counted by the quantity of labor, not the price of labor by the quantity of other things. Thus, if we want to plant an apple sapling in rocky ground, it may take two hours' work. In soft ground, perhaps only half an hour. Grant the soil equally good for the tree in each case. Then the value of the sapling planted by two hours' work is no wise greater than that of the sapling planted in half an hour. One will bear no more fruit than the other. Also, one half hour of work is as valuable as another half hour. Nevertheless, the one sapling has cost four such pieces of work, the other only one. Now the proper statement of this fact is, not that the labor on the hard ground is cheaper than on the soft, but that the tree is dearer. The exchange value may, or may not, afterwards depend on this fact. If other people have plenty of soft ground to plant in, they will take no cognizance of our two hours' labor, in the price they will offer for the plant on the rock. And if, through want of sufficient botanical science, we have planted an upas tree instead of an apple, the exchange value will be a negative quantity, still less proportionate to the labor expended. What is commonly called cheapness of labor signifies, therefore, in reality, that many obstacles have to be overcome by it, so that much labor is required to produce a small result. But this should never be spoken of as cheapness of labor, but as dearness of the object wrought for. It would be just as rational to say that walking was cheap, because we had ten miles to walk home to our dinner, as that labor was cheap, because we had to work ten hours to earn it. The last word which we have to define is production. I have hitherto spoken of all labor as profitable, because it is impossible to consider under one head the quality or value of labor, and its aim. But labor of the best quality must be various in aim. It may be either constructive, gathering from con and strew, as agriculture, nugatory as jewel-cutting, or destructive, scattering from d and strew, as war. It is not, however, always to prove labor, apparently nugatory, to be actually so. Generally the formula holds good. He that gathereth not scattereth. Thus the jeweler's art is probably very harmful in its ministering to a clumsy and inelegant pride. Footnote. The most nugatory labor is, perhaps, that of which not enough is given to answer a purpose effectually, and which therefore has to be done over again. Also, labor which fails of effect through non-cooperation. The curate of a little village near Bellinzona, to whom I had expressed wonder that the peasants allowed the Ticino to flood their fields, told me that they would not join to build an effectual embankment high up the valley, because everybody said that it would help his neighbors as much as himself. So every proprietor built a bit of low embankment about his own field, and the Ticino, as soon as it had a mind, swept away and swallowed all up together. End footnote. So that, finally, I believe nearly all labor may be shortly divided into positive and negative labor, positive, that which produces life, negative, that which produces death, the most directly negative labor being murder, and the most directly positive the bearing and rearing of children, so that in the precise degree in which murder is hateful, on the negative side of idleness, in the exact degree child-rearing is admirable, on the positive side of idleness. For which reason, and because of the honor that there is in rearing children, while the wife is said to be as the vine, for cheering, the children are as the olive branch, for praise, nor for praise only, but for peace, because large families can only be reared in times of peace, though since in their spreading and voyaging in various directions they distribute strength, they are to the home strength as arrives in the land of a giant, striking here and there far away. Footnote. Observe, I say, rearing, not begetting. It is strange that men always praise enthusiastically any person who, by a momentary exertion, saves a life. 
but praise very hesitatingly a person who, by exertion and self-denial, prolonged through years, creates one. We give the crown obsivum servitum, why not obsivum netum? Born, I mean, to the full, in soul as well as body. England has oak enough, I think, for both chaplets. Labor being thus various in its result, the prosperity of any nation is in exact proportion to the quantity of labor which it spends in obtaining and employing means of life. Observe, I say, obtaining and employing, that is to say, not merely wisely producing, but wisely distributing and consuming. Economists usually speak as if there were no good in consumption, absolute. Footnote. When Mr. Mill speaks of productive consumption, he only means consumption which results in increase of capital or material wealth. See 1, 3, 4, and 1, 3, 5. End footnote. So far from this being so, consumption absolute is the end, crown, and perfection of production, and wise consumption is a far more difficult art than wise production. Twenty people can gain money for one who can use it, and the vital question, for individual and for nation, is never how much do they make, but to what purpose do they spend. The reader may, perhaps, have been surprised at the slight reference I have hitherto made to capital and its functions. It is here the place to define them. Capital signifies head or source or root material. It is material by which some derivative or secondary good is produced. It is only capital proper, caput vivum, not caput mortuum, when it is thus producing something different from itself. It is a root which does not enter into vital function till it produces something else than a root, namely fruit. That fruit will in time again produce roots, and so all living capital issues in reproduction of capital. But capital which produces nothing but capital is only root practicing root bulb issuing in bulb, never in tulip, seed issuing in seed, never in bread. The political economy of Europe has hitherto devoted itself wholly to the multiplication, or, less even, the aggregation of bulbs. It never saw nor conceived such a thing as a tulip. Nay, boiled bulbs they might have been, glass bulbs, Prince Rupert's drops, consummated in powder, well, if it were glass powder and not gunpowder, for any end or meaning the economist had in defining the laws of aggregation. We will try and get a clearer notion of them. The best and simplest general type of capital is a well-made plowshare. Now, if that plowshare did nothing but beget other plowshares, in a polypus manner, however the great cluster of polypus plow might glitter in the sun, it would have lost its function of capital. It becomes true capital only by another kind of splendor, when it is seen, splendicer silco, to grow bright in the furrow, rather with diminution of its substance than addition, by the noble friction. And the true home question, to every capitalist and to every nation, is not, how many plows have you, but where are your furrows, not how quickly will this capital reproduce itself, but what will it do during reproduction. What substance will it furnish good for life? what work construct protective of life if none its own reproduction is useless if worse than none for capital may destroy life as well as support it its own reproduction is worse than useless it is merely an advance from tisiphony on mortgage not a profit by any means not a profit as the ancients truly saw and showed in the type of ixion for capital is the head or fountain head of wealth and the well head of wealth as the clouds are the well-heads of rain. But when clouds are without water, and beget only clouds, they issue in wrath at last, instead of rain, and in lightning instead of harvest. Whence Ixion is said first to have invited his guests to a banquet, and then made them fall into a pit, as also Demas's silver mine, after which, to show the rage of riches passing from lust of pleasure to lust of power, yet power is not truly understood, Ixion is said to have desired Juno, and instead, embracing a cloud, or phantasm, to have begotten the centaurs, the power of mere wealth being, in itself, as the embrace of a shadow, comfortless. So also Ephraim feedeth on wind, and followeth after the east wind, or that which is not. Proverbs 23, 5. And again Dante's Gerion, the type of avaricious fraud, as he flies, 
gathers the air up with retractile claws, l'air à serreculos, but in its offspring, a mingling of the brutal with the human nature, human in sagacity, using both intellect and arrow, but brutal in its body and hoof, for consuming and trampling down. Footnote. So also in the vision of the woman bearing the FF, before quoted, the wind was in their wings, not wings of a stork, as in our version, but milvi, of a kite, in the vulgate, or perhaps more accurately still, in the septuagint, Hupo, a bird connected typically with the power of riches by many traditions, of which that of its petition for a crest of gold is perhaps the most interesting. The birds of Aristophanes, in which its part is principal, are full of them. Note especially the fortification of the air with baked bricks, like Babylon, 1, 550, and again compare the Plutus of Dante, who, to show the influence of riches in destroying the reason, is the only one of the powers of the inferno who cannot speak intelligibly, and also the cowardliest. He is not merely quelled or restrained, but literally collapses at a word, the sudden and helpless operation of mercantile panic being all told in the brief metaphor, as the sails swollen with the wind fall when the mast breaks. End footnote. For which sin Ixion is at last bound upon a wheel, fiery and toothed, and rolling perpetually in the air, the type of human labor, when selfish and fruitless, kept far into the Middle Ages in their wheels of fortune, the wheel which has in it no breadth or spirit, but is whirled by chance only, whereas of all true work the Ezekiel vision is true, that the spirit of the living creature is in the wheels, and where angels go the wheels go by them, but move no otherwise. This being the real nature of capital, it follows that there are two kinds of true production, always going on in an active state, one of seed and one of food, or production for the ground and for the mouth, both of which are by covetous persons thought to be production only for the granary, whereas the function of the granary is but intermediate and conservative, fulfilled in distribution, else it ends in nothing but mildew, and the nourishment of rats and worms. And since production for the ground is only useful with future hope of harvest, all essential production is for the mouth, and is finally measured by the mouth. Hence, as I said above, consumption is the crown of production, and the wealth of a nation is only to be estimated by what it consumes. The want of any clear sight of this fact is the capital error, issuing in rich interest and revenue of error among the political economists. Their minds are continually set on money gain, not on mouth gain, and they fall into every sort of net and snare dazzled by the coin-glitter as birds by the fowler's glass, or rather, for there is not much else like birds in them, they are like children trying to jump on the heads of their own shadows, the money gain being only the shadow of the true gain, which is humanity. The final object of political economy, therefore, is to get good methods of consumption, and great quantity of consumption, in other words, to use everything, and to use it nobly, whether it be substance, service, or service-perfecting substance. The most curious error in Mr. Mill's entire work, provided for him originally by Ricardo, is his endeavor to distinguish between direct and indirect service, and consequent assertion that a demand for commodities is not a demand for labor. One, nine, and forward. He distinguishes between laborers employed to lay out pleasure grounds and to manufacture velvet, declaring that it makes material difference to the laboring classes in which of these two ways a capitalist spends his money, because the employment of the gardeners is a demand for labor, but the purchase of velvet is not. Footnote. The value of raw material, which has indeed to be deducted from the price of the labor, is not contemplated in the passages referred to, Mr. Mill having fallen into the mistake by pursuing the collateral results of the payment of wages to middlemen. He says, The consumer does not, with his own funds, pay the weaver for his day's work. Pardon me, the consumer of the velvet pays the weaver with his own funds as much as he pays the gardener. He pays, probably, an intermediate ship-owner, velvet merchant, and shopman, pays carriage money, shop rent, damage money, time money, and care money. All these are above and beside the velvet price, just as the wages of a head-gardener would be above the grass price but the velvet is as much produced by the consumer's capital, 
though he does not pay for it till six months after production, as the grass is produced by his capital, though he does not pay the man who mowed it and rolled it on Monday till Saturday afternoon. I do not know if Mr. Mill's conclusion, the capital cannot be dispensed with, the purchasers can, page 98, has yet been reduced to practice in the city on any large scale. End footnote. Error colossal as well as strange. It will indeed make a difference to the laborer whether we bid him swing his scythe in the spring winds, or drive the loom in pestilential air. But, so far as his pocket is concerned, it makes to him absolutely no difference whether we order him to make green velvet with seed and a scythe, or red velvet with silk and scissors. Neither does it any wise concern him whether, when the velvet is made, we consume it by walking on it or wearing it, so long as our consumption of it is wholly selfish. But if our consumption is to be in any wise unselfish, not only our mode of consuming the articles we require interests him, but also the kind of article we require with a view to consumption. As thus, returning for a moment to Mr. Mill's great hardware theory, it matters, so far as the laborer's immediate profit is concerned, not an iron filing, whether I employ him in a growing a peach, or forging a bombshell, but my probable mode of consumption of those articles matters seriously. Admit that it is to be in both cases unselfish, and the difference to him is final, whether when his child is ill I walk into his cottage and give it the peach, or drop the shell down his chimney and blow his roof off. Footnote which, I observe, is the precise opposite of the one under examination. The hardware theory required us to discharge our gardeners and engage manufacturers. The velvet theory requires us to discharge our manufacturers and engage gardeners. End footnote. The worst of it, for the peasant, is that the capitalist's consumption of the peach is apt to be selfish, and of the shell distributive. But in all cases, this is the broad and general fact, that on due catalactic commercial principles, somebody's roof must go off in fulfillment of the bomb's destiny. You may grow for your neighbor, at your liking, grapes or grape shot. He will also, catalytically, grow grapes or grape shot for you, and you will each reap what you have sown. Footnote. It is one very awful form of the operation of wealth in Europe, that it is entirely capitalist wealth which supports unjust wars. Just wars do not need so much money to support them, for most of the men who wage such wage them gratis. But for an unjust war, men's bodies and souls have both to be bought, and the best tools of war for them besides, which makes such war costly to the maximum, not to speak of the cost of base fear and angry suspicion between nations which have not grace nor honesty enough in all their multitudes to buy an hour's peace of mind with, as at present, France and England, purchasing of each other ten millions sterling worth of consternation annually, a remarkably light crop, half thorns and half aspen leaves, sown, reaped, and granaried by the science of the modern political economist, teaching covetousness instead of truth. And all unjust war being supportable, if not by pillage of the enemy, only by loans from capitalists, these loans are repaid by subsequent taxation of the people, who appear to have no will in the matter, the capitalist's will being the primary root of the war, but its real root is the covetousness of the whole nation, rendering it incapable of faith, frankness, or justice, and bringing about, therefore, in due time, his own separate loss and punishment to each person. End footnote. It is, therefore, the manner and issue of consumption which are the real tests of production. Production does not consist in things laboriously made, but in things serviceably consumable, and the question for the nation is not how much labor it employs, but how much life it produces. For as consumption is the end and aim of production, so life is the end and aim of consumption. I left this question to the reader's thought two months ago, choosing rather that he should work it out for himself than have it sharply stated to him. But now, the ground being sufficiently broken, and the details into which the several questions here opened must lead us, being too complex for discussion in the pages of a periodical, so that I must pursue them elsewhere, I desire, in closing the series of introductory papers, to leave this one great fact clearly stated. There is no wealth but life. Life, including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. 
that country is the richest which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings that man is richest who having perfected the functions of his own life to the utmost has also the widest helpful influence both personal and by means of his possessions over the lives of others a strange political economy the only one nevertheless that ever was or can be all political economy founded on self-interest being but the fulfillment of that which once brought schism into the policy of angels and ruin into the economy of heaven footnote in all reasoning about prices the proviso must be understood supposing all parties to take care of their own interest mill three one five end footnote the greatest number of human beings noble and happy but is the nobleness consistent with the number yes not only consistent with it but essential to it the maximum of life can only be reached by the maximum of virtue in this respect the law of human population differs wholly from that of animal life the multiplication of animals is checked only by want of food and by the hostility of races the population of the gnat is restrained by the hunger of the swallow and that of the swallow by the scarcity of gnats man considered as an animal is indeed limited by the same laws hunger or plague or war are the necessary and only restraints upon his increase effectual restraints hitherto his principal study having been how most swiftly to destroy himself or ravage his dwelling-places and his highest skill directed to give range to the famine seed to the plague and sway to the sword but as considered other than an animal his increase is not limited by these laws it is limited only by the limits of his courage and his love both of these have their bounds and ought to have his race has its bounds also but these have not yet been reached nor will be reached for ages in all the ranges of human thought i know none so melancholy as the speculations of political economists on the population question it is proposed to better the conditions of the laborer by giving him higher wages nay says the economist if you raise his wages he will either people down to the same point of misery at which you found him or drink your wages away he will i know it who gave him this will suppose it were your own son of whom you spoke declaring to me that you dared not take him into your firm nor even give him his just laborer's wages because if you did he would die of drunkenness and leave half a score of children to the parish who gave your son these dispositions i should inquire has he them by inheritance or by education by one or the other they must come and as in him so also in the poor either these poor are of a race essentially different from ours and unredeemable which however often implied i have heard none yet openly say or else by such care as we have ourselves received we may make them continent and sober as ourselves wise and dispassionate as we are models arduous of imitation but it is answered they cannot receive education why not that is precisely the point at issue charitable persons suppose the worst fault of the rich is to refuse the people meat and the people cry for their meat kept back by fraud to the lord of the multitudes alas it is not meat of which the refusal is cruelest or to which the claim is validest the life is more than the meat the rich not only refuse food to the poor they refuse wisdom they refuse virtue they refuse salvation ye sheep without shepherd it is not the pasture that has been shut from you but the presence meat perhaps your right to that may be pleadable but other rights have to be pleaded first claim your crumbs from the table if you will but claim them as children not as dogs claim your right to be fed but claim more loudly your right to be holy perfect and pure footnote james verse four observe in these statements i am not talking up nor countenancing one whit the common socialist idea of division of property division of property is its destruction and with it the destruction of all hope all industry and all justice it is simply chaos a chaos towards which the believers in modern political economy are fast tending and from which i am striving to save them the rich man does not keep back meat from the poor by retaining his riches but by basely using them riches are a form of strength and a strong man does not injure others by keeping his strength but by using it injuriously 
The socialist, seeing a strong man oppress a weak one, cries out, Break the strong man's arms. But I say, Teach him to use them to better purpose. The fortitude and intelligence which acquire riches are intended, by the giver of both, not to scatter, nor to give away, but to employ those riches in the service of mankind, in other words, in the redemption of the erring and the aid of the weak. That is to say, there is first to be the work to gain money, then the Sabbath of use for it, the Sabbath whose law is not to lose life but to save. It is continually the fault or the folly of the poor that they are poor, as it is usually a child's fault if it falls into a pond, and a cripple's weakness that he slips at a crossing. Nevertheless, most passers-by would pull the child out, or help up the cripple. Put it at the worst that all the poor of the world are but disobedient children, or careless cripples, and that all rich people are wise and strong, and you will see at once that neither is the socialist right in desiring to make everybody poor, powerless, and foolish as he is himself, nor the rich man right in leaving the children in the mire. End footnote. Strange words to be used of working people. What, holy, without any long robes nor anointing oils, these rough-jacketed, rough-worded persons, set to nameless and dishonored service? Perfect! These, with dim eyes and cramped limbs, and slowly wakening minds? Pure! These, with sensual desire and groveling thought, foul of body and coarse of soul? It may be so. Nevertheless, such as they are, they are the holiest, perfectest, purest persons the earth can at present show. They may be what you have said, but if so, they are yet holier than we who have left them thus. But what can be done for them? Who can clothe, who teach, who restrain their multitudes? What end can there be for them at last but to consume one another? I hope for another end, though not, indeed, for many of the three remedies for overpopulation commonly suggested by economists. These three are, in brief, colonization, bringing in of waste lands, or discouragement of marriage. The first and second of these expedients merely evade or delay the question. It will indeed be long before the world has been all colonized, and its deserts all brought under cultivation. But the radical question is not how much habitable land is in the world, but how many human beings ought to be maintained on a given space of habitable land. Observe, I say, ought to be, not how many can be, Ricardo, with his usual inaccuracy, defines what he calls the natural rate of wages as that which will maintain the laborer. Maintain him? Yes, but how? The question was instantly thus asked of me by a working girl to whom I read the passage. I will amplify her question for her. Maintain him how? As, first to what length of life? Out of a given number of fed persons, how many are to be old? How many young? That is to say, will you arrange their maintenance so as to kill them early, say at thirty or thirty-five on the average, including deaths of weakly or ill-fed children, or so as to enable them to live out a natural life? You will feed a greater number, in the first case, by rapidity of secession, probably a happier number in the second. Which does Mr. Ricardo mean to be their natural state, and to which state belongs the natural rate of wages? Footnote. The quantity of life is the same in both cases, but it is differently allotted. End footnote. Again, a piece of land which will only support ten idle, ignorant, and unprovident persons will support thirty or forty intelligent and industrious ones. Which of these is their natural state, and to which of them belongs the natural rate of wages? Again, if a piece of land support forty persons in industrious ignorance, and if, tired of this ignorance, they set apart ten of their number to study the properties of cones and the sizes of stars, the labor of these ten, being withdrawn from the ground, must either tend to the increase of food in some transitional manner, or the persons set apart for sidereal and conic purposes must starve, or else someone else starve instead of them. What is, therefore, the natural rate of wages of the scientific persons, and how does this rate relate to, or measure, their reverted or transitional productiveness? Again, if the ground maintains at first forty laborers in a peaceable and pious state of mind, but they become in a few years so quarrelsome and impious that they have to set apart five, to mediate upon and settle their disputes, 
ten armed to the teeth with costly instruments, to enforce the decisions, and five to remind everybody in an eloquent manner of the existence of a god, what will be the result upon the general power of production, and what is the natural rate of wages of the meditative, muscular, and oracular laborers? Leaving these questions to be discussed, or waived, at their pleasure by Mr. Ricardo's followers, I proceed to state the main facts bearing on that probable future of the laboring classes, which has been partially glanced at by Mr. Mill. That chapter and the preceding one differ from the common writing of political economists in admitting some value in the aspect of nature, and expressing regret at the probability of the destruction of natural scenery. But we may spare our anxieties on this head. Men can neither drink steam nor eat stone. The maximum of population on a given space of land implies also the relative maximum of edible vegetable, whether for men or cattle, it implies a maximum of pure air and of pure water. Therefore, a maximum of wood, to transmute the air, and of sloping ground, protected by herbage from the extreme heat of the sun, to feed the streams. All England may, if it so chooses, become one manufacturing town, and Englishmen, sacrificing themselves to the good of general humanity, may live diminished lives in the midst of noise, of darkness, and of deadly exhalation. But the world cannot become a factory, nor a mine. No amount of ingenuity will ever make iron digestible by the million, nor substitute hydrogen for wine. Neither the avarice nor the rage of men will ever feed them, and however the apple of Sodom and the grape of Gomorrah may spread their table for a time with dainties of ashes and nectar of asps, so long as men live by bread, the far-away valleys must laugh as they are covered with the gold of God, and the shouts of his happy multitudes ring round the wine-press and the well. Nor need our more sentimental economists fear the too widespread of the formalities of the mechanical agriculture. The presence of a wise population implies the search for felicity, as well as for food. Nor can any population reach its maximum but through that wisdom which rejoices in the habitable parts of the earth. The desert has its appointed place and work. The eternal engine, whose beam is the earth's axle, whose beat is its year, and whose breath is its ocean, will still divide imperiously to their desert kingdoms, bound with unfurrable rock, and swept by unarrested sand, their powers of frost and fire. But the zones and lands between, habitable, will be loveliest in habitation. The desire of the heart is also the light of the eyes. No scene is continually and untiringly loved but one rich by joyful human labor, smooth in field, fair in garden, full in orchard, trim, sweet, and frequent in homestead, ringing with voices of vivid existence. No air is sweet that is silent. It is only sweet when full of low currents of undersound, triplets of birds, and murmur and chirp of insects, and deep-toned words of men, and wayward trebles of childhood." As the art of life is learned, it will be found at last that all lovely things are also necessary, the wild flower by the wayside, as well as the tented corn, and the wild birds and creatures of the by every wondrous word and unknowable work of God. Happy in that he knew them not, nor did his fathers know, and that round about him reaches into the infinite the amazement of his existence." Note, finally, that all effectual advancement towards this true felicity of the human race must be by individual, not public, effort. Certain general measures may aid, certain revised laws guide, such advancement, but the measure and law which have first to be determined are those of each man's home. We continually hear it recommended by sagacious people to complaining neighbors, usually less well placed in the world than themselves, that they should remain content in the station in which Providence has placed them. There are perhaps some circumstances of life in which Providence has no intention that people should be content. Nevertheless, the maxim is on the whole a good one, but it is peculiarly for home use. That your neighbor should, or should not, remain content with his position is not your business, but it is very much your business to remain content with your own. What is chiefly needed in England at the present day is to show the quantity of pleasure that may be obtained by a consistent, well-administered competence, modest, confessed, and laborious. We need examples of people who, leaving heaven to decide whether they are to rise in the world, decide for themselves that they will be happy in it, 
and have resolved to seek not greater wealth, but simple pleasure, not higher fortune, but deeper felicity, making the first of possessions self-possession, honouring themselves in the harmless pride and calm pursuits of peace. Of which lowly peace it is written that justice and peace have kissed each other, and that the fruit of justice is sown in peace of them that make peace, not peacemakers in the common understanding, reconcilers of quarrels, though that function also follows on the greater one, but peace-creators, givers of calm. Which you cannot give, unless you first gain, nor is this gain one which will follow assuredly on any course of business, commonly so called. No form of gain is less probable, business being, as is shown in the language of all nations, venire, vendre, and vino, from vino, essentially restless, and probably contentious, having a raven-like mind to the motion to and fro, as to the carrion food, whereas the olive-feeding and bearing birds look for rest for their feet. Thus it is said of wisdom that she hath builded her house, and hewn out her seven pillars, and even when, though apt to wait long at the door-posts, she has to leave her house and go abroad, her paths are peace also. For us, at all events, her work must begin at the entry of the doors. All true economy is law of the house. Strive to make that law strict, simple, generous. Waste nothing and grudge nothing. Care in no wise to make more of money, but care to make much of it, remembering always the great, palpable, inevitable fact, the rule and root of all economy, that what one person has another cannot have, and that every atom of substance, of whatever kind, used or consumed, is so much human life spent, which, if it issue in the saving present life, or gaining more, is well spent, but if not, is either so much life prevented, or so much slain. In all buying, consider first what condition of existence you cause in the producers of what you buy. Secondly, whether the sum you have paid is just to the producer, and in due proportion, lodged in his hands, Thirdly, to how much clear use, for food, knowledge, or joy, this that you have bought can be put, and fourthly, to whom, and in what way, can it be most speedily and serviceably distributed, in all dealings whatsoever, insisting on entire openness and stern fulfilment, and in all doings, on perfection and loveliness of accomplishment, especially on fineness and purity of all marketable commodity watching at the same time for all ways of gaining or teaching powers of simple pleasure and of showing the sum of enjoyment depending not on the quantity of things tasted but on the vivacity and patience of taste footnote the proper offices of middlemen namely overseers or authoritative workmen conveyances merchants sailors retail dealers etc and order takers persons employed to receive directions from the consumer must of course be examined before I can enter farther into the question of just payment of the first producer. But I have not spoken of them in these introductory papers, because the evils attendant on the abuse of such intermediate functions result not from any alleged principle of modern political economy, but from private carelessness or iniquity. End footnote. And if, on due and honest thought over these things, it seems that the kind of existence to which men are now summoned by every plea of pity and claim of right, may, for some time at least, not be a luxurious one, consider whether, even supposing it guiltless, luxury would be desired by any of us, if we saw clearly at our sides the suffering which accompanies it in the world. Luxury is indeed possible in the future, innocent and exquisite, luxury for all, and by the help of all, but luxury at present can only be enjoyed by the ignorant, and the cruelest man living could not sit at his feasts, unless he sat blindfolded. Raise the veil boldly, face the light, and if as yet the light of the eye can only be through tears, and the light of the body through sackcloth, go thou forth weeping, bearing precious seed, until the time come, and the kingdom, when Christ's gift of bread and bequest of peace shall be unto this last as unto thee, and when, for earth's severed multitudes of the wicked and the weary, there shall be holier reconciliation than that of the narrow home, and calm economy, where the wicked cease, not from trouble, but from troubling, and the weary are at rest. End of Essay 4, Part 2, From Unto This Last End of Unto This Last, by John Ruskin